Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's Spring Science Speak Seminar. My name is Jeff Schlato. I'm the director of the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. To learn more about Turk, the research we conduct here and around the world, the public education and citizen science programs we provide for the local and regional community, and our work with government agencies in the Tahoe Basin and beyond, please visit our website, tahoe.ucdavis.edu. You can also find out how to follow us on social media, how you can participate in our activities and help support our activities, including these monthly lectures. For those of you interested in learning about being a docent at Turk, we have our 2021 docent training program scheduled to be um, taking place next month. The first session is June 17th. So anyway, go to the uh, tahoe.ucdavis.edu website to find out more about that. One of the goals of our seminars is to facilitate interaction, dialogue, and discussion. Um, doing that in the age of Zoom is a challenge. Uh, the way we will be doing it today is using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, so the only way for you to ask questions or make comments is to type them into the Q&A, not the chat function. Um, Q&A, and then our presenters will try to get to as many as possible. Before I introduce today's speakers, I wanted to alert you to a very special upcoming event. Uh, between June 21 and 26, 6th, we'll be circumnavigating Lake Tahoe by kayak. So we'll be led by world-class kayak builder and enthusiast Scott Fitzgerald and over a six day period, making our way around the shoreline, collecting scientific samples, making observations and learning about the lake. So again, to find out more about that and to register, uh, go to our website under events. Uh, and if you only have a paddle board or a canoe, that's fine. No motorboats and no swimming, please. So we've all experienced the ravages of wildfire. On a personal level, I had family members who were evacuated from the Paradise Fire a few years ago, uh, and they were staying with us uh, while that event played out. Managing wildfires is now a major issue for the governments of California and Nevada. But the question today is, are there other approaches? So for thousands of years, Native Americans in what is now California and across the West treated and nurtured fire as a tool through the practice of cultural burning. For non-native people, cultural burns require a, a mental adjustment, one that views fire as a restorative, not a destructive process. So today we have um, a committee, we have a group of people, not a committee, that's a bad word. Uh, we have a, some wonderful panelists. So we have Professor Beth Rose Middleton uh, from the UC Davis Department of Native American Studies. And we have Ron, Ron Good, the tribal chairman of the North Fork Mono tribe. We're also expecting Herman Fillmore, the cultural language resources director of the Washoe tribe as well, but he appears to be delayed at present. And they're going to be talking about Native American practice of cultural burning. So to start this off, I'm going to turn over Zoom uh, to, to Beth Rose, and she will be introducing uh, Ron Good. So Beth, it's, uh, sorry, Rose, Beth Rose, it's with you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really glad to be here with you all. Um, I want to acknowledge, start off by acknowledging and thinking about where we are, uh, where the Turk is, the Tahoe Environmental Research Consortium within Washoe homelands, and acknowledge that Washoe people are leaders in language and cultural preservation and stewardship of traditional homelands. I don't know if uh, Mr. Herman Fillmore, who's the Language and Cultural Resources Director for the Washoe Tribe, uh, will be able to join us today. Uh, that was our, our plan, but he may have been, he may have been delayed or 
or otherwise um, otherwise pulled away from being able to come today. But I just really would like to acknowledge that uh, that the work of the Washoe tribe is precedent setting, and I hope a future forum might focus on their work within and around the Tahoe Basin within their homelands. So thank you, and I'm, I'm speaking to you today from Putwin Homelands in Davis, and as always, really delighted and honored to be with Chairman Ron Good. And Chairman Good has many, um, many great accomplishments and accolades, but I'll give really a more personal introduction. I first met Chairman Good about 2009 or so when he was leading some discussions in, uh, in the, on the water plan, which led to the development of the Tribal Water Summit. Since that time, I've been able to work with him on water related topics, uh, tribal participation and leadership in water stewardship, in changing the dialogue on water policy. He's written many powerful pieces dealing with traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous relationship to water, the importance of story and traditional narrative and how those represent and explain kinship to and responsibility to water. Most recently, I've been able to work with Chairman Good over the last few years on cultural burning and developing educational opportunities for um, for other tribal nations, for students, for various partners from agencies and conservation nonprofits to learn about and increase their respect for and recognition of the importance of the practice of cultural burning. So thank you so much, Ron, and I will turn it over to you and start sharing your slides. Manahu, Manituau, Chau, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, I too am here in uh, in Mono Land, Noom Country. So this is. Uh, I think what I'm going to have to do is um, hire uh, Professor Beth Rose to be my publicist. That was a pretty good little intro. <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to it or not. Um, go ahead to the next one. I'm just going to chat for just a moment. So one of the things that, you know, as, as we started out, it's, it's all about the water. You know, the whole idea of burning is to raise the water table. And in the end, that's what we want is for the water to come back when we have too much overgrowth when we have vegetation that is not holding water when vegetation is dying or dead it is not holding water then water that is falling from the sky um, hits the ground hits the hits the canopy and goes directly just runs off. It is not uh, beneficial and is not doing the landscape any good. So it's very important that, um, as you heard uh, Jeff introduce the whole um, talk today, in that um, you know that that's our that's our that's our desire is to uh, have renewal. And renewal because when we burn and we put fire on the land, we want a fresh, rejuvenated resource to come back. One that's going to be healthy, healthy so that our culture will be sustained, sustained in the um, in the manner that harvesting for food for product, for fiber, for medicine. These things uh, are all part of when we, not only when we lived out on the land, but the fact that we still live out there on the land and off the land. Today, these medicines are very important to us. The health of our resources are very important to us. And so, we have to have renewal, and that renewal is fire. In our old stories is that um, 
our creation stories tells us, you know, that when the Noom get their fires off the land, the water will rise. And so when we're doing cultural burning today, and, and you know, why do we call it cultural burning? Um, we don't really call it cultural burning. It's kind of a new terminology. Um, but what we're doing are restoring the cultural resources. And it's what we've been doing for uh, millennia. So we have as a tribe, and this is pretty much for every tribe, but as a tribe, we have close to 200 cultural resources that we utilize and 95 different food sources. And so when you look at that type of um, product that we need to have to have a sustainable culture that's going to thrive, not survive, but thrive, then we need to have all of our resources healthy. We start in these first three photos in terms of cultural spirituality because we have to recognize the spirits of the land just as Beth Rose was acknowledging the people of the land and the ancestors of the land. Our ancestors are still out there. And so not only in people, but in terms of our relationship and our relations, rather it's a plant, a shrub, a tree, grass, these things all uh, have a spirit. And so that is part of our philosophy. We have to recognize that. We have to understand that it exists. Um, when you look at that, that picture that's, you know, of the spirits of the land, uh, what I see is an Indian holding a snake and they're rising up out of the fire. We also have new, new references to these fires, whether we're talking about cultural burning or whether we're talking about wildfires, but that's a fire NATO. They come right up out of the fire, circle up, and they will walk from one fire to another, from one bush to another. And it's kind of like when we look at our wildfires that we just um, encumbered this past year, and especially the Creek Fire here, which is one of the largest single fires in the history of California, that when the fire started, it was pretty small. Nobody expected it to go anywhere. But within an, an overnight, it did start going somewhere because across the creek and down in the in the drainage all these resources that needed fire called it they called it it went to them and then it called wind and the mono wind came and it never went beyond the drainage it stayed in that drainage and created its own weather system Pretty amazing stuff when you actually look at what was going on in the relationship between fire and wind. And when the uh, NASA people were looking down on through, you know, through satellite, what they saw was a rainstorm inside of all of that thunder and lightning that was going on. Those are the spirits of the land and how they're related to each other. I want to move along a little quicker, because of, but I want to relate what the, the wildfire is to where we are. And so it's really important we recognize that relationship. Um, when something needs to be burned, when something has died or dying, then it needs to be restored. 
And, you know, so you can look at this, the red bud and you see this great big red bud and it looks beautiful when it's alive, but it has no more functionality and it is not useful except to look pretty. So at that point in time, it needs to be restored. And so that's what we set out to do. Go ahead. Next one. So bring in, okay, there we go. Okay, somewhere we went. <laughs> that one, I guess. But I think we missed one someplace. So it should have showed the restoration. Go back one. Oh, I see. I see. I'm 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 blocked over here. Let me uh, let me take care of that for a minute. Get myself out of the picture. All right. So over on the right it is looking at the restoration within a matter of a few months that returns. And now we can go to the next picture. And so from that time forward, I've been you know working with uh, many different colleges, including. UC Davis and bringing volunteers in from, you know, five, six different colleges, five or six different agencies, um, eight or 10 different tribes and community people all coming together. This, this group picture here shows one of our basket makers with an armload of, of the red bud that she harvested. Uh, the following year, we looked down to some of our Dunlap elders and they came back and harvested, you know, bundles of, of basketry sticks. And the following year was no different. So this just gives you an idea of what we're uh, using and utilizing the sticks for when we're making these baskets. Rather it's a baby basket or a gathering basket. Those, if we're out to gather sawberries, this is what we're restoring. We got to have that gathering basket. So, you know, all this works together. Go ahead, next. Is there another one? Okay. There we go. So when we're looking at um, restoring the land and restoring what um, our resources, you can see what, a, a dead and dying uh, bush begins to look like. If you look really carefully, you will see the color of a kind of a yellow green inside of that bush. And that is lichen. And so lichen has been attacking this bush for quite some time and basically destroying it. Now, this bush burned really easy and really hot. So if a wildfire was gonna be coming through, this was nothing but good fuel for that wildfire. But when you look down to the bottom, and that's the same area that we just burned and the return that we're looking for, now we're looking within one month to two months of um, a new return, there's also medicine plants that are coming up inside of there. Look around the outside of it, and all the beautiful flowers, the lupins and the owl's clovers and, and, and you know, the snowdrops, everything else that's coming up. That didn't actually have fire, but it was next to the fire and smoke. So it all goes together. Next. This is back to a, a, another piece of the ground. We, we, in this particular area, I actually burn in four different counties, Mariposa, Madera, Fresno, and Tulare. This one is all in Mariposa and we burn on about uh, 400 acres. Um, lately only about 120 acres is what we've been working on in the last three or four years. And so uh, clearing it and opening it up, if you see all those rocks up there, 
Uh, every one of those rocks is a part of the a former, uh, not former, but a cultural site in terms of um, where the Indian folks process their foods. And so that's, that's all there. Sometimes we don't even know it's there until we open it up and then we find it. Um, well, you see a lot of the trees that are trimmed and cut. You also see that you can see through those uh, trees where you couldn't before. And the whole point is, is that we are clearing away the dead limbs, the so that this these trees can be refreshed and grow properly. Let's move back about a couple of hundred years when the Indian people lived out here and um, that big pounding rock that's sitting down there in the right lower right hand corner. We have on, on this site, uh, on this 120 acres piece, um, it's almost all the village. We have like between 35 and 40 um, features that are on this site. So everywhere we burn, there's midden, there's artifacts, there's bedrocks, there's uh, firecrack rock, there's cooking rocks. Everywhere we go, that whole land was utilized at one point by maybe some 600 different people that lived here in this area. So when they lived here, this is how they cleaned it up because they had to use the wood. They didn't have chainsaws a couple hundred years ago, you know. So they just made sure that, you know, their fire is burned pretty much constant. You have fire for breakfast, you have fire for lunch, fire for dinner, fire for the evening. So the fires were always going. So that meant they had to have wood all the time. Keep going. Next. So th those are important points. That's right, back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go back one. Yeah, there we go. Important points because um back when I, there you go stay there for a minute um because we don't realize sometimes that what living out on the land means you know we go out and we might camp once or twice a year maybe once or twice every five years the people that actually lived out there when we have our cultural burning camps we have 50 to 60 people one year we had 100 there's a lot of wood we go through and a lot of, you know, cleanup that we're doing. But we get a lot of fire done. So when you look through these pictures and all of this, you know, was just full of, of uh, shrubbery and dying bushes that needed to be cleaned up. And now you see how they're being restored and foods and medicines and fibers. But it's not just medicine for the Indian people. The animals need this medicine as well. If our animals are not healthy, if our animals are not flourishing, and our deer are definitely not flourishing, our bear is starting to make a comeback. But, you know, many other animals are not flourishing like they need to be. And so if they're sick, if they're unhealthy, it's because they need medicine. When we're sick and we're unhealthy, where do we run to? We run down to the pharmacy. Well, this was the pharmacy for everybody that lived out on the land. Next. One of the things though in climate change and in times of where we are today that temperatures have changed. Uh, so when that we have this drier climate 
and which means that vegetation plants that are drier climate type plants begin to become dominant. Star thistle, tarry weed, California daughter, all these different um, things begin to take over from the native plants, native grasses. So not a whole lot of animals eat tarweed. And if the tarweed becomes so dominant that there's no more grass underneath, then you're not gonna have a whole lot of deer coming to graze on this meadow. It doesn't even look like a meadow at that point. So we put fire onto it and, and restored it. And so, you know, when we do that, we also raise the water. Is that the last slide, Beth, or is there one more? No, okay. All right, um, how much time I got? Beth? Maybe about five minutes. Five minutes, okay, excellent. So really quick, um, one way looking at uh, the differences between prescribed fire that CAL FIRE, Forest Service, Park uh, conducts fire versus cultural burning, we're looking to restore the resource that is the one that needs to be there. Um, and so after our big pasture burn, the grasses, the native grasses started coming back. And that, but that's true. So this down in the lower water picture, you see a large number of dead and dying willows all along the lake bed. In a previous year, or, or uh, so last year actually, we burnt all those willows. And now they are all shooting up really beautiful, really nice. And, um, you know, so many folks come here to this land to gather and harvest uh, because we are renewing it. Okay, we'll come back, but for now. I'll take a break. Thank you so much, Chairman Good. I will go help ahead and pull up my slides. Oops. Okay, so that was a wonderful presentation. And I will have uh, some, some similar images, some different ones talking about the work we have been able to do from UC Davis with students, as well as through the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center to collaborate with Chairman Good to around the education and cooperative components of this cultural burning focused uh, restoration. So as, as Ron spoke about, um, we think about the context in which we're bringing fire back to the land. And this context, as, as you all know, is one of increasing temperature, increasing aridity, drought, and increasing risk of catastrophic fire. The legacy of fire suppression has led us to this place where we have forests that are overstocked, uh, dead and dying material, whether that's trees or brush, and also along with the suppression of fire and mismanagement, along with that, and part of it, has been suppression of indigenous practices of stewardship, indigenous care for the land, and attempted removal of indigenous peoples and or removal of access to traditional homelands. So there are significant negative human and ecological outcomes to both fire suppression and attempted removal of native peoples. We're talking about California, but also beyond. And part of this work in cultural burning is recognizing traditional knowledge of landscape stewardship and the importance of native led restoration, 
some of the co-benefits that flow from that are ecosystem health, health of culturally important species, local employment, training of people in, in these um, successful mechanisms of land stewardship, empowerment around the recognition of indigenous knowledge, caring for land, and directly addressing a history of oppression and exclusion. And I am really interested in the link between Newsom's Executive Order N1519, which apologized to California Indigenous peoples, and emerging land management, land stewardship policies, such as reflected in the Forest and Fire Resilience Action Plan and the 30 by 30 initiative. How well do those link with Indigenous-led restoration and stewardship? So our education aspect focuses on the importance of, of training or at least exposing current and future resource managers to the importance of cultural burning, how to build respectful collaborations, where we can find funding for collaborative land restoration, and the importance of ensuring land access to conduct this type of stewardship uh, by Indigenous peoples, tribes, coalitions. There's a lot of emerging science. Some of it is, is um, you know, a few years old, but many things are coming out this year about the effectiveness of cultural burning for increasing habitat, as, as Ron was speaking about, raising the water table, improving ecosystem health, reducing the risk of catastrophic fire. Uh, these are a couple of pictures. Ron was saying he burns across multiple counties. This, I, ref I think, reflects some of your work in the Sierra National Forest. Uh, doing the work to cut back some of the overgrowth and then the cultural burning that followed and then how you can see the meadow open to towards the bottom there. So th there are some really terrific publications. I list some of them here. Some of the key authors being uh, Dr. Frank Lake, Dr. Don Hankins, um, doc uh, Dr. Jonathan Long, Kat An Dr. Kat Anderson. So and of course, Chairman Good and um, Dr. Jared Aldrin. So a lot of good work out there documenting some of the positive impacts of cultural burning on specific species and landscapes across different time frames, and not just the impact of fire, but also the positive impact of smoke. So there is a lot to learn in terms of monitoring some of the impacts of cultural burning as well. And some of these photos you saw, this was, was from one of our first burns with uh, NAS 161, uh, California Indian Environmental Policy, which is a course I teach at UC Davis. And these are our students. Uh, Chairman Good is over here directing students in terms of how to prepare for the burn. We're working here with sourberry and redbud. And the burn uh, is completed in just right right where it's planned to take place. And then we mix in the ash into the soil. And you saw this image before too of um, Jesse working alongside Chairman Good. So a few, a few lessons or things that I'm learning about cultural burning are that it can be very site specific. It's low intensity, it's repetitive. You come back as, as Ron has told me before and spoken to groups before about, it's not just uh, coming in like some approaches to prescribe fire, doing a burn and never returning. It's a relationship to a place. You, you come in, you come back, you maintain. And this can be extrapolated to a landscape scale. I think sometimes I hear people misunderstanding cultural burning and saying that, okay, it's just about this specific bush or this specific area, uh, quite contrary, it can be used in a much broader area. And I think it has historically been used that way with people talking about, for example, I'm thinking of Lorena Gorbett, who's uh, with the Maidu Summit, talking about a relative crossing the mountains and lighting fire as that person went. So it is site specific, but can be across a much broader landscape. It's underlined and guided by ethics of relationality, uh, concentricity, responsibility to care for, uh, respect and reciprocity, giving and receiving. I really like the way Bill Tripp uh, from Karuk Natural Resources talks about human services that benefit ecosystems rather than the more Western concept we often hear of ecosystem services. What about the way human activity can provide services to ecosystems and burning is one part of that activity. The practice of cultural burning varies uh, by landscape, by relationship to the place, by community, by the conditions of any given year. 
and some of the important uses of cultural burning or outcomes are reducing pests and acorn, for example, and other traditional foods. As Ron was speaking of, stimulating the regeneration and the health and revitalization of native plants, reducing invasive species, raising the water table, creating habitat. So many benefits. These are some images from our burn just this last March, working with elderberry, uh, with Ron again near Mariposa opening up these culturally important places, uh, cutting back some, some plants and bushes that are very overgrown with a lot of dead and woody material. And we follow Ron's guidance in terms of how to prepare the area for a burn. We follow similar prescriptions at the tending and gathering garden, working with the weavers there in terms of, I think we call it chunking, cutting back the plants and piling it on the center for the burn. And then we ignite. And that's some of the, the after effects of burning. Uh, this was a particular elderberry that maybe Ron will talk about more when we get to the discussion, but it was, it was overgrown. And so you can see it's all the way burned down. Then we mix in the ash and the soil, put water on, put the burn to sleep. And I think this is some regrowth on that site. So we have been able to coordinate to host these cultural fire workshops with the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, which has become really invested in supporting this cultural burning work, and I'm really grateful for that. And these workshops create opportunities for restoration of landscapes, for collaboration between tribes, collaborations between tribes and agencies, and the growth of knowledge among students and faculty. So uh, some of our supporters include the, the Climate Adaptation Science Center, the Yochidihi Endowed Chair here in my Department of Native American Studies, and in the past also the Department of Plant Sciences has supported. We had to downscale our workshops this year, but we still were able to have smaller workshops. Uh, we were in Mariposa twice with Chairman Good, and we were also at the Tending and Gathering Garden at the Cache Creek Nature Preserve outside of Woodland. And one of the special things about being at the TGG is that because it's so close to the UC Davis campus, we go out there many times. So we probably go out four or five times for work days prior to the burn and then at least two times after the burn. And it's really uh, fulfilling in that way that we can be part of the whole process of preparing the site, burning, and then cleaning up the site after. And I would love to expand that more with the burns we do in other places, including in um, in Mariposa if possible. So a lot of diverse attendees from many different uh, contexts and organizations. In Mariposa back in 2020, that we uh, focused on the meadow impacted by invasive plants, uh, burning culturally important plants like the, to revitalize the sourberry and the elderberry. And then the wonderful work of being able to accompany the weavers as they gathered and processed uh, basketry material. And also in our first burn this last year, in actually 2021, in February, we were able to contribute to restoring some historic trails along the creek. So some of the outcomes on the land uh, Ron mentioned this as well, but I think you'll see everywhere new growth, revitalization of culturally important plants, a great reduction in brush, which affects the water table, uh, people coming out to gather these materials coming available, both uh, in Mariposa and at the Tending and Gathering Garden. One of our uh, PhD students in the Department of Native American Studies at UC Davis, Melinda Adams, has plans for doing some soil surveys, um, looking at the impact on the soils after burning. We saw increases in biodiversity, different types of plants, uh, birds, insects coming back once these areas are restored. And of course, this is a long-term relationship, maintenance, return, and stewardship over time. And these are some images of some of the wildflowers coming back in the meadow and lupins. Um, and so a few, a few directions to consider. Um, some emerging state policies I was pleased to see in the January 2021 California Wildfire and Forest Resilient Action Plan that tribes were recognized as partners in developing prescribed fire and funds were recommended to support cultural burning. Uh, that's extremely important to increase support for indigenous led application of fire and um, Cultural fire, cultural burning is distinct from prescribed burning as, as Ron was alluding to, and maybe we can discuss more in, in discussion. 
I'd also like to point to the California Climate Assessment for which had the first tribal and indigenous chapter. Ron was a coordinating lead author on that, and I was a contributing author, and there were many other wonderful contributors. And Executive Order N8220, uh, another Newsom order on biodiversity, recognize, acknowledge uh, the importance of cultural burning in California. The current 30 by 30 initiative is very interesting, um, conserving 30% of California land and waters by 2030. I am currently participating in the equity panel and really trying to um, assert the importance of not just enclosing for conservation, I'm sure others are thinking of this as well, but ensuring that there's indigenous leadership and stewardship of these lands in order to maintain their health into the future. Some increasing opportunities in support of Indigenous lead burning. We are currently in search of a postdoctoral fellow uh, that will work with the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center and also coordinate with postdocs at all of the other climate adaptation science centers on a, a focus on fire. And our particular fellow will focus on cultural burning and collaborations with Indigenous peoples, Indigenous-led projects around fire. So for anyone on who's interested in that opportunity, please reach out or look at the UC Davis um, job listings and it should be there. We are looking for good applicants for that position. I'm always looking for support for more intertribal collaborations, the Keepers of the Flame workshops, and for tribal agency and tribal university partnerships and expanding the areas where we can implement indigenous led application of good fire on the landscape. I'm also um, very hopeful in seeing the landowners associations, uh, fire safe councils, groups that are coming together in collaboration with tribes and others to do local low intensity burning. So thank you so much. We look forward to having conversation with you about these initiatives. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Beth Rose and Chairman Good. Um, Edge, I'd like to start the question and answer session with a, a question of my own. Um, and I'm, I'm originally from Australia, where, where the Aboriginal people there, particularly in the, I guess, the northern part of Australia, which is sort of semi-tropical, subtropical, use, con not control, but use cultural burning extensively. Actually, one of the, the seasons is referred to as the smoke season because it's smoky for three months of the year. But it, it's a very different climate um, when, they, when they burn. It's sort of before the monsoons come. So it's very humid, not so arid. So getting to the idea that, you know, Beth Rose raised about um, upscaling and doing this at a landscape scale. I mean, either of you, how, how, how large do you think this can be, number one? And also, is there a particular season? I mean, would you have landscape scale burning in September and October um, in California? Would this be something that need, needed to be done in, say, the late spring? Yeah, uh, this is Ron. Um, those are all good questions. Um, we ourselves have um, uh, a sister relationship to the Mardu of Western uh, Australia. They've been over here. We've actually been over there. And uh, so, but on, uh, to further your, your question there, uh, how big can it get? One of the things that uh, this past year I have been, uh, you know, talking with Hawaii, uh, First Nation people in Canada, uh, the Mohawk, the Oneida, um, the Seminole in Florida, and some of the Southwest uh, tribes. And there, all these people are burning, you know. Um, Florida, not necessarily the Indians or the, or the Seminoles, but Florida as a state burns pretty close to 2 million acres. You know, the only, only way we in California get to 2 million is when the wildfires come roaring through, right? Um, otherwise, we're just a measly few thousand acres. 
but we should be burning a whole lot more than that. Um, all the agencies. One of our problems here in California versus say other states or even other parts of the, of the world is our, um, the urban interface. And even in the hills and the mountains, um, communities have been allowed to, you know, rise up on every ridge. And so a lot of these places in, that uh, burned out in the Creek fire, um, the people that go there to live in the mountains, just the reason they go there is so they can have a tree growing up next to their kitchen and one up through their deck, you know, that they go there to be with the trees. But you have to understand if that's what you're going there for, then what's gonna happen when a wildfire comes? So I bring that point up because it becomes very difficult for agencies to burn seven miles down the ridge and pray that their fire doesn't get away from them. Because if it does, then it's taking out some community or some township. And so that really hinders what kind of fire agencies can put on the ground. When we move that back to the scale of where we as indigenous practitioners are, um, we're burning three to 10 acres a weekend. But we're burning, like I said earlier, you know, we're burning over 100, 125 acres as I continually burn year after year. I would burn more if I could. Uh, it is costly. It takes a lot of energy to be able to put a burn camp together. And, but when you start allowing, or let's say not necessarily allowing, but when we start looking to say, if all the tribes are able to burn and other folks besides tribes burn, I try to express to the agencies, you don't have to burn 400 to 800 acres every time you walk out the door to go burn. You can burn 25 or 50 acres in a day or two. And that smoke won't go down into the valley or into the or over the hill to the other side of the mountain to take people out and cause havoc with their health issues. You can burn small and burn every day. When I travel around the mountains and I go up into North Fork and Bass Lake and Corskull and Oakhurst and Awani and Mariposa, these are all small little communities. But every time that I drive through, there are six or seven fires going, and these are not by indigenous people, but by indigenous community people that live there. Ranchers, all taking care of their lands. And nobody even sees or smells that smoke because there's only six or seven small fires going, but they go every day. But you can't get that across to the agencies. And so, you know, if we want to do more burning, it's got to be small. And, and I'll let Beth Rose kick in here, but when you go back and you study history, I, I, I'm an archaeologist as well. And, you know, back in 1874 to 1894, one of the first um, um, Euro Americans came into our land in North Fork. And he kept a diary, kinsman diary, for 20 years. But throughout his diary, he talks about getting up early in the morning before the sun rises, and there's them damn Indians burning already with six, seven fires going. You know, man, they already got them fires going, and I, I barely coming out my door, and the sun's not even up yet. But that's the way they burned. 
it's not like you have to go and light up 500 to 1,000 acres just to get something done. I'd like to just jump in on a couple of the questions you asked, and one was about seasonality. So this is going to vary, of course, based on where you are and what's there. But I know for our collaborations, we have burned in the early spring. I think we could also burn in the fall, and we're exploring when and where that's possible and with whom. Um, also, in terms of preparing the land for a burn, uh, one thing to think about is where some, you know, the, the landscape scale on which we need to work to improve forest health. Other systems we might draw on for where some of the small diameter material, where some of like the biomass could go, uh, maybe, maybe generation of power, finding ways to make that make sense economically so that the land can be prepared for low intensity burning. And then you mentioned Australia. And one thing that's very interesting there are the policy mechanisms that support Aboriginal burning. So there is recognition of Aboriginal burning there as enhancing carbon sequestration capacity in the soil. And that has enabled support for funding for cultural burning uh, on a scale that we haven't seen yet here. Great. Thank, thank you both uh, for for those comments. Um, a question here, maybe building on this, um, on this idea um, is sort of question, I mean, you've mentioned some of the, you've given some examples of, of how um, Native people are working at times with agencies and, um, and the like. Um, but I guess the question here asks, are there, are there additional ways or ways that you would suggest to, to agencies how they work with Native American groups to enhance their efforts? I think, I think every, well, we, I was about to say, I think we have this, the same goals. Maybe, maybe we don't. Um, but I think people, certainly from an agency perspective, they're trying to control wildfires or eliminate wildfires. So it seems that there is a, an opportunity to learn um, and how can that learning be take place? How can how can better communication be established? Do you think well, that's to both of you, or either of you? <laughs> so I have a a wild answer for you. It's pretty hard for a cowboy to be an Indian. Fairly easy for an Indian to be cowboy, but when you look at agencies and how they've been trained and what they've been doing for so long, how do they revert over to looking at cultural burning? So I burned with Sequoia Park and I saw one of the questions there earlier. I burned three years with Sequoia Park and we chose two of the 15 burns that they did to be called cultural burning. In order to make it a cultural burning, then we were burning to increase and monitor the acorn, not only for your native folks, but for the animals. First of all, they didn't know who they fed, who the animals were. Secondly, they had no clue to how much acorn they had. So we had two burns, both of them totaling about, you know, 200 trees. But throughout there, there were a number of dead trees maybe almost 10%. Then when they burn, they scorch trees. So we begin, and then there was downed limbs. So we begin to tell them that as a cultural burning, the whole idea is that we need to get rid of everything that's dead and dying. And you have to make room for new vegetation. You cannot burn every year. If you're burning every year, how are you going to have new vegetation? So they had no new oaks and they had no new growth in their burns because they were burning every year. So we couldn't get them to stop burning every year. We couldn't get them to clean up the dead trees and the dead brush. We did monitor the acorn production and the acorn production went from 36% to 54% because we put fire on the ground. But in the end, 
because they wouldn't change how they were doing things, we had to leave them because they were no longer doing cultural burning. And so one day they talked to us still. One day they want us to come back and, you know, maybe we will. But the answer to what you, the question was, was is how do you change them? I bring agencies in with me. I let them watch. I let them help. They still have their techniques that they want to apply, which don't work. And it's very difficult for them to be able to change. Uh, I've had a CAL FIRE person with me. He's a lead CAL FIRE person in the state. He's been with me for about three years and he is slowly getting there, <laughs> right? Maybe one day, another three years, he might get there. But that's just one, you know, how, how do you change the agency, right? And, you know, CAL FIRE burns along the highway because, you know, Governor Newsom told him to, to put more fire on the land and especially along the road so we don't have these wildfires from fires that start along the highways. And so they burned a 10 a mile stretch along the road. And in doing so, they managed to scorch over 36 trees and killed 24 of them, simply because they didn't know how to prep properly. And because it also takes a lot of work to do preparation. And so, you know, we have a lot of training to go to and a lot of, a lot of, you have to be patient. We'll, we'll get there maybe. I actually have 36 scorched trees below my house here at Tahoe. That was the result of a controlled burn. So, uh, yeah, Beth, uh, Beth Rose, did you want to add something? Yes, well, just on that last point, the importance of funding the preparatory work, which is also important for job creation. Um, and I wanted to note just a couple ways in which policy does not facilitate cultural burning, especially on public lands, regarding who can do the burning, who's authorized, who's the burn boss. Uh, I, I recognize that these are really important designations, but I also recognize that people, uh, for example, like Chairman Good and others have extensive knowledge of fire practice, you know, from childhood, and that's not always recognized by those designations. When can, can burning take place and for what purposes, uh, I think. And also considering uh, the air quality regulations, that can be, that can be challenging as well. Uh, there was a question I saw that was about smoke. Um, and I know Ron can speak to this as well, but some of the, the literature, the way it talks about the some of the positive effects of smoke, I think we're all familiar with the negative effects of smoke, but some of the positive effects of smoke from small low intensity burning are cooling, cooling water uh, and kind of a fumigation activity in the trees, getting rid of some of the parasites in the trees. So I know Ron could add more to that, but I wanted to add to that question in the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, ahead, you know, I, I showed some of my slides showed, you know, smoke on the land. But, uh, you know, and I've studied our 2008, 2015, 2018, and 2020 uh, fires. And what we look at is um, the sudden death syndrome in oaks, the mistletoe that is killing uh, oaks and, and willows and, and cottonwoods, um, all these different parasites that they are all slowed to a crawl after a major fire when we've, throughout the state when we've had enough smoke to slow them down. And then they start gaining after two or three years. You, you just literally can, see it on the land. Okay, well, that uh, brings us, I think, to another question. Um, um, is there a magic number um, as to the frequency of, of, um, of, of the burnings? I mean, or does that vary with location, with the vegetation, with, with the goals? Um, any, well, 
my my people have always told me you need to burn three times in 10 years um what i've discovered through the last 15 20 years of my burning is at least twice in 10 years and six six to eight years is the magic so where wherever i've burned it takes six to eight years before the thickness of what I've burned begins to come back. So up to that time, it's still fairly thinned out. And that's a question that is constantly arisen in terms of people who are challenging cultural burning and the essence of cultural burning. What they don't realize is that once we've burned, our burned area is good for six to eight years. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess that there was a question here about uh, something you just referred to, uh, Ron, about the um, work in the Sequoia or practices in the Sequoia National Park, I guess, in the 1970s um, and how they did have cultural burning taking place there to prevent larger fires but um, apparently those practices from 50 years ago have been discontinued um, any ideas why or, or, or can you remember a time when cultural burning was was more widely used in forest management uh if you go back into the 60s and 70s there were throughout California, even on forest, um, where, where they did try to do burning, you know, in, in the cultural manner for two or three years. And then it usually means that it, it's a change of administration. So the same thing happened where I just got done burning with, with Sequoia Park and they were changing uh fire bosses you know every two years and so pretty soon you get to somebody that has you know no interest in trying to do cultural burning and i think that's really the the essence of what happens when you see change okay thank you so i actually i i'm going to now pass the that on, on to Heather Sigali, um, because I have to take off for a meeting with my boss. Um, so, and, and well, part of the time Heather is my boss, but it's a different boss today. So um, Heather, if you could continue with a question and answer, that would be appreciated. And, and as I leave, I just wanted to acknowledge both Chairman Good and Beth Rose Middleton for participating today and everybody for being here. But the questions and answers are continuing in my absence. Bye all. Great, thank you, Jeff. Bye, Jeff. Um, so it looks like there is a question in the chat uh, that was regarding the widespread reset of landscapes from the wildfires of 2020 and previously. And what strategy do you use to restore cultural burning to those landscapes that have recently, you know, have had these devastating wildfires? What do we do in that case? Um, I'll take a take it for a little bit. Every fire, every fire, as as indigenous people we always ask the agency, where are you going to burn and when are you going to burn? As soon as that wildfire is still smoldering, we are asking that question because on that landscape, there's, going, there's parts of that landscape that burned, that burned just like our cultural burn. They burned at low intensity and they have immediate return. I've driven around out there with trees still burning 
and have seen within a matter of a week black trees and large shrubs with fresh shoots coming right out of the root system because it was just right. Just enough heat, just enough ash, just enough nutrient for what it needed. Now on the Creek Fire, some 378,000 acres, 25% of the Creek Fire was high severity. And so with high severity, what that means is and the, the fourth supervisor brought this up to us. He said, we'd like to do as much work as we can out here so that in a hundred years, we'll know, you know, what it might look like. And I said, no problem. Because if you're not going to do anything with that 25% high severity, it's still going to be there 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. But in the rest of the fire, it is all going to start to return immediately. So there, and the things that are going to return are some of the shrubberies that are going to be fire prone for the future. So you're going to look at anywhere between four and six years of when it needs to be reburned. Okay, so um, I want to, it's after one, I want to start to wrap it up, but I would like to think about next steps. So um, Professor Middleton, you mentioned the idea of hosting a workshop or doing some next steps up at Tahoe. What, what would be the best next steps? Um, we had a contact for, in the chat from the Tahoe Regional Plan Planning Agency that indicated an interest in um, helping and uh, Tom has been a part of or have let, has led around 200 prescribed burns in the Midwest and has completed courses. And so we have a contact with the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency where we could consider doing whatever you would recommend as a next step up here at the lake. Thank you. Well, I think that would I would really defer that question to the Washoe tribe, uh, to their environmental department and their language and cultural department. Uh, I believe they are already doing some stewardship that includes fire uh, on lands in the basin. So I think that that would be a good next step would be maybe a meeting between Turk and uh, and those from the Washoe tribe who might like to participate and maybe TRPA as well to develop some collaborative planning. I mean, my work on this uh, in this area is really around policy and education. So bringing people together to implement the restoration, indigenous-led restoration to restore these areas and make them more resilient to various climate change and uh, catastrophic fire and other effects that can impact landscapes and human communities. So that's what I would recommend, a beginning conversation, if there isn't already conversation with the Washoe tribe. It'll be very regionally specific. Yeah, we had hoped to have Herman Fillmore here today. It sounds like maybe um, they just had a new baby or something, so perhaps uh, <laughs> busy with babies. Um, we really appreciate you jo both joining us today and um, it is after one. I know we all have other obligations this afternoon. Um, is there anything else, um, Honorable Ron Good, that you would like to share? <laughs> no, just thank you very much and the more education we can put out there is good. Thanks. And I might just add, I know that we, there were questions we didn't get to. And uh, if you're able to leave your email, we can try to respond to them via email. Great. I'll keep it live here for one more second here so that we can respond via email. And thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your afternoon. And um, I will be collecting all of the uh, chat and, and sharing those forward.